خلق الذين من دونه بل الظالمون في ضلال مبين ولقد آتينا لقمان الحكمة أن اشكر لله ومن يشكر فإنما يشكر لنفسه ومن كفر فإن الله غني حميد وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعظه يا بني يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملته أمه وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين أن اشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير أن اشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهداك على أن تشرك بي ما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا بني إنها إن تك مثقال حبة من خردل فتكون في صخرة أو في السماوات أو في الأرض يأتي بها الله إن الله لطيف خبير يا بني أقم الصلاة وأمر بالمعروف وأمر بالمعروف وانهى عن المنكر واصبر على ما أصابك إن ذلك من عزم الأمور ولا تصعر خدك للناس ولا تمشي في الأرض مرحا إن الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور واقصد في مشيك واغضض من صوتك إن أنكر الأصوات لصوت الحمير ألم تروا أن الله سخر لكم ما في الأرض ألم تروا أن الله سخر لكم ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وأسبغ عليكم نعمه ظاهرة وباطنة ومن الناس من يجادل في الله بغير علم ولا هدى ولا كتاب منير وإذا قيل لهم اتبعوا ما أنزل الله قالوا قالوا بل نتبع ما وجدنا عليه آباءنا أولو كان الشيطان يدعوهم إلى عذاب السعير ومن يسلم وجهه إلى الله وهو محسن فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى وإلى الله عاقبة الأمور صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد على محمد وآل محمد الثاني أهل حب الحسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد 
نويت ان ازور سيدي ومولاي الامام الحسين أصالة عن نفسي وعن والدي ومن قلدني الزيارة السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا خيرة الله وابن خيرته السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت وعظمت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلت وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أهل السماوات فلعن الله أمة أسست أساس الظلم والجور, والجور عليكم أهل البيت ولعن الله أمة دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم عن مراتبكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة قتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من قتالكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم ومن أشياعهم وأتباعهم وأوليائهم يا أبا عبد الله إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم إلى يوم القيامة ولعن الله آل زياد وآل مروان ولعن الله بني أمية قاطبة ولعن الله ابن مرجانة ولعن الله عمر بن سعد ولعن الله شمرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتنقبت لقتالك بأبي بأبي أنت وأمي لقد عظم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مقامك وأكرمني بك أن يرزقني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتقرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بموالاتك وبالبراءة ممن قاتلك ونصب لك الحرب وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس الظلم والجور عليكم وأبرأوا إلى الله وإلى رسوله ممن أسس أساس ذلك وبنى عليه بنيانه وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى 
أشياعكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأتقرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بموالاتكم وموالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم والناصبين لكم الحرب وبالبراءة من أشياعهم وأتباعهم إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن والاكم وعدو لمن عاداكم فأسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أوليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن يثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة وأسأله أن يبلغني المقام المحمود لكم عند الله وأن يرزقني طلب ثاري مع إمام هدى ظاهر ناطق بالحق منكم وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشأن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبته مصيبة ما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والأرض اللهم اجعلني في مقامي هذا من من تناله منك صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محياي محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بني أمية وابن آكلة الأكباد اللعين ابن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموقف وقف فيه نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم لعن أبا سفيان ومعاوية ويزيد ابن معاوية عليهم منك اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرحت به آل زياد وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه اللهم فضاعف عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب الأليم اللهم إني أتقرب إليك في هذا اليوم وفي موقفي هذا وأيام حياتي بالبراءة منهم واللعنة عليهم وبموالاة لنبيك وآل نبيك عليه وعليهم السلام اللهم لعن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم لعن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم لعنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم All together السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم خص أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني 
وابدا به اولا ثم العن الثاني والثالث والرابع اللهم العن يزيد خامسا والعن عبيد الله بن زياد وابن مرجان وعمر بن سعد والشمراء وآل أبي سفيان وآل زياد وآل مروان إلى يوم القيامة اللهم لك الحمد حمد الشاكرين لك على مصابهم الحمد لله على عظيم رزيتي اللهم ارزقني شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود وثبت لي قدم صدق عندك مع الحسين وأصحاب الحسين الذين بذلوا مهجهم دون الحسين عليه السلام صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Inshallah, we will now start with the lecture. So let us welcome Shaykh Imam Nasruddin with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Honor of Abi Abdullah al Hussein of Lahman Salala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى أمك بعد أمك أم البنين يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلا يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيم. It is narrated that Ibn Abbas said, I was with the commander of the faithful, peace be upon him, when he went to Safin. 
On our way to Safin, we stopped at the land of Nainawa'ah by the coast of the Euphrates, meaning the land of Karbala. And so Ali Salawatullah Ali called me using his highest voice, telling me, Ibn Abbas, O oh son of Abbas, do you know this land? I told him, no, I do not know it, O oh commander of the faithful. And so he said, if you knew it just as I know it, you would not pass by it without crying as I cry. Then the Imam Salawatullah Alayh cried for a long time. Amir al Mu'mineen was remembering what will happen on that land, the land of Karbala, after he departs from this world. He cried for a long time to the point Ibn Abbas says he soaked his beard with his tears and the tears of Ali fell on his chest. Ah, the Imam was saying, Mali, Wali Ali Abi Sufyan, what business does the progeny of Abi Sufyan have with me? What business does the progeny of Harab have with me? What business does the progeny of Harb, the guardians of disbelief, and the party of the devil have with me? Then Amir al Mu'mineen addressed Aba Abdullah, who was with him. Imam al Hussein was with him. He told him, Sabran ya Aba Abdullah. A patience, O oh, Abba Abdullah, for your father has seen mistreatment similar to the mistreatment you shall see from them. I say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, as you pass by Karbala, when you pass by Karbala, you begin weeping for Imam al Hussein salawatullah alayhi to the point you soak your beard with your tears. Sayyidi, what happened to you on the day of Ashura as you were witnessing what was happening to Aba Abdullah and to your progeny and especially to Lady Zainab? Ah, may Allah bless the poet as he says Ya ayyuhannaba'ul azim Ya ayyuhannaba'ul azim Ilayka fi ibnayka minni a'zamul anba'i Oh, Ali, he tells him, oh, he who is a Naba al Azim, I have awful news to tell you about your sons. Ya Ali, as for your son Hassan, he vomited pieces of his liver when he was poisoned. And as for your son Hussein, his body was severed into pieces in Karbala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Holy Quran, In Ibrahim can a matan, Kanitan lillahi hanifa. In honor of Abi Abdullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad, wa Ali Muhammad. In yesterday's majlis, we mentioned that just as the Quran informs us that 
the believers, the righteous believers are a minority, it also informs us that sometimes we might have a believer who is so devoted to Allah Ta'ala, so faithful, that his existence equates the existence of hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions of people. Allah says regarding Ibrahim alayhi salam, Inna Ibrahim kana ummah. Surely Abraham was a nation. He was one man. But his presence equated the presence of thousands, if not millions of people. We explained why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this about Ibrahim. Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. And today, we want to continue where we left off. As Allah Azza wa Jal describes Ibrahim al-Khalil. We're going to take a few minutes to understand these qualities that Ibrahim had. Salamullah alayhi. Now one might say, what is the significance of this? Why should I read or listen about the qualities of Ibrahim? Salamullah alayhi. Well, because he's a great role model. He's one of the five top prophets. And Allah says, Kana ummatan. He was a nation. So when you learn the qualities of Ibrahim and you try to gain the same qualities, you will also become what? An impeccable human being whose presence will equate the presence of tens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of human beings. Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَانَ أُمَّةً قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ He was qanit. Qanit means what? It means he was obedient. He was very obedient to Allah Jalla Jalaluh. And as you know, all prophets are infallible, so his obedience was constant. It was continuous. Ibrahim alayhi salam was so obedient, as you all know, when Allah Ta'ala commanded him to slaughter Ismail, what did he do? He submitted to Allah's command. And he was actually willing to slaughter Ismail. Ismail, on the other hand, also submitted to Allah's command. Both of them, their submission was beyond impeccable. The father and the son. And they were ready to do it. In fact, they were on the brink of doing it. To the point the tradition says Ibrahim السلام, placed a knife or a blade on the neck of Ismail. But as soon as he wanted to slaughter him, Jabrail السلام, flipped the blade. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to stop. خلص. That's enough. You have upheld the command. You have upheld the command, Ya Ibrahim. And so he was very obedient, very submissive. Now, bear in mind, it's very easy to speak about this story. We can talk about it day and night, but to actually be the father or the son, to be the person who's slaughtering his own son, or to be the son who's being slaughtered by his father, qurbatan ila Allah, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a totally different story. It's very hard. But Ibrahim Salamullah Ali had unbelievable submission to God. Then he says, Hanifa, Ibrahim was Hanif. Hanif means what? It means that Ibrahim السلام, was following a middle path. He would avoid going to the extremes. He would follow a middle path. What's interesting is, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi also followed a middle path and commanded his nation to follow the middle path such that Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran when describing the Muslim nation he says وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا He says we made you a nation, a middle nation, a nation that walks on the middle path. Here, many of you might be asking, what does that exactly mean? 
walking on the middle path, avoiding the extremes. What does that mean? Can you clarify? Let me give you an example that will clarify this important concept, walking on the middle path. Of course, we can give plenty of examples, but we want to move on with the qualities of Ibrahim, salamullahi alayh, to finish his qualities tonight and then to move on to another topic pertaining to Surat Al-Fajr. Walking on the middle path means what? Let me give you an example. When looking at spirituality and being connected to spiritual issues or material issues, people have different opinions. Some people tell you What's mostly important is focusing on your spirituality and your spirit such that you only need to focus on your spirituality and spirit. All you need to do is worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, for example, praying and performing supplication. You need to work on your spirit and you need to detach yourself from all material issues except the very few necessary issues or things you need to do on a physical level to remain in existence some people have this idea in mind they have this belief then again you have another group of people who say the exact opposite they say what you need to do when you live on earth is focus on il maddiyat focus on material issues throw spirituality behind your back or in the trash focus on working acquiring money acquiring fame acquiring you know 10,000 likes on Instagram focus on that and don't worry about salat siyam and all of those worships we see a lot of people with this mentality where in the West, right? The mentality that tells you focus on your material, on your physical life. What's the stance of Islam regarding this issue? Islam says what? Islam says both are wrong. Yes, spirituality is important and you need to be spiritual, you need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, you cannot detach yourself from the physical world you are a human being meaning you have a body and you have a soul which means your soul has needs that need to be fulfilled how do i fulfill the needs of my soul through salat siyam hajj and similar worships then again your body has needs how do i fulfill the, the needs of my body through for example eating drinking, sleeping, getting married, so on and so forth. So Islam tells me you need to fulfill the needs of your body in a lawful way and you also need to fulfill the needs of your soul. You cannot neglect your body and you cannot neglect your soul. So both extremes should be avoided and you should walk where? On the middle Hence, Imam al-Sadiq salawatullah wa salamu alayhi says, as you can find in Mawsu'at Ahadith Ahl al-Bayt 4 in Najafi. He says, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ تَرَكَ دُنْيَاهُ لِآخِرَتِهِ وَلَا آخِرَتَهُ لِدُنْيَاهُ He said, if someone sacrifices his life in the hereafter for his life on earth. That person is not part of our group. But on the other hand, if someone sacrifices his life on earth for his life in the hereafter, that person is also not part of our group. How so? Isn't that confusing? No, it's not confusing. What the Imam means to say, salawatullah alayh, is that when you're on earth, you cannot completely detach yourself from worldly issues. You have to eat, you have to drink, you have to get married, you have to work, 
and acquire sustenance, but you do it in the lawful way. At the same time, you cannot forget about the hereafter because ultimately it is our final abode. And so, the mu'min, the real mu'min, the real believer, the one who follows Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim, will pray, fast, he will uphold his ties with his family members, what we call Salat al-Rahim, he'll treat his parents with kindness, but at the same time, he will take care of his worldly issues. Which of the two are more, imp are more important? Definitely the issues of the hereafter, but he will not neglect any of the two. Yes, as he lives on earth, the believer will not allow the love of this world to overwhelm his soul. Because if the love of the world overwhelms our souls, then we will sacrifice the hereafter for our current world. And the sad reality is, this world is just temporary. Right now we're being tested. It's all a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is temporary. It has a beginning and it has an end. Sooner or later, we're all going to be in Barzakh. The other world, on the other hand, Al-Akhirah, that is the real world. It has a beginning, but it does not have an end. Over there, you shall see the results and I shall see the results of your deeds and my deeds. Hence, one should not be fooled by a dunya, by this current world. Allah says, وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Ibrahim السلام, was not a polytheist. Indeed, he was one of the giants of monotheism. شَاكِرًا لِأَنْعُمِهِ He would Thank Allah Ta'ala for his blessings. What's interesting is Allah says an'umi. And an'um is what we call in the science of Arabic grammar, jama'a Which means that Ibrahim would thank Allah Ta'ala for any blessing that Allah would bestow upon him. He would thank Allah Ta'ala for any blessing, even if that blessing was small or little in amount, let alone what he would do if Allah gave him a lot of blessings. So when Allah says, Shakiran li an'umih, Allah is telling you, Ibrahim alayh, would thank Allah for every single blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal bestowed upon him. Ijtabahu wa hadahu. Allah says, Allah selected Ibrahim. As you heard yesterday, Ibrahim was a prophet and was an imam. Correct? A prophet and an imam. Allah says, Allah selected him and he guided him to a straight path. Hadahu ila sirat al-mustaqim. Here a question comes to mind. Why did he guide him to a straight path? Well, for two reasons. Number one, because Allah Ta'ala is very kind. And Allah loves to guide everyone. Hence, he bestows guidance upon everyone. Didn't Allah Azza wa Jal send the messenger, Salamullah alayhim? Didn't he appoint the imams of Ahlul Bayt after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Are they supposed to guide one specific group of people? Or are they supposed to guide everyone? What do you say? Everyone, Right? He's supposed, they're supposed to guide everyone. Yesterday or the day before, we said Musa was sent to Pharaoh. Allah told him, go to Pharaoh, warn Pharaoh. So Allah Azza wa Jal guided Pharaoh. Guided in what sense? In the sense that he showed him the way. Allah shows everyone the right way. Surah Al-Insan says what? Inna hadaynahu sabil, imma shakiran, wa imma kafura. We guided the human being and showed him that this is the path of thankfulness, meaning this is the path that leads you to salvation, and this is the path of what? Unthankfulness. This is the path which leads you to your doom. Now you choose which path you want to follow. So Allah guides Ibrahim, salamullah alayhi. Number one, because Allah guides everyone. And number two, because Ibrahim is worthy of guidance, and Allah sees that Ibrahim alayhi salam is constantly 
trying to get closer and closer to God. Ibrahim performs the actions that please God. He wants to reach higher levels of proximity to Allah. Jalla Jalalu. And when Allah sees this, what does he do? When Allah sees this, Allah Azza wa Jal brings you closer to him. When he sees that you're making the slightest effort to please him, Allah bestows upon you a large amount of mercy and brings you closer. You might think <coughs> that you have to do something very difficult, very complicated for Allah Azza wa Jal to accept you and to bestow a large amount of mercy on you. Wrong. Allah Azza wa Jal is very merciful. When you do something that is small according to human beings, such as paying a dollar, not a thousand dollars, a dollar, one dollar, as charity. Or praying two rak'ahs, not 20 rak'ahs, not Salat Ali al-Rida, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Two rak'ahs at night or during the day to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Or for example, you give your mom a hug before you leave to work. When Allah Ta'ala sees that you're doing a gesture to get closer to Him, Allah does what? He brings you closer because He's the All-Merciful. He wants you to get closer. Listen to the following tradition by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is a very important tradition. If you come out tonight with only this tradition, it will be more than enough. But inshallah, we're going to come out with more. During these nights, we want to maximize our benefits as we learn from the master of martyrs, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamahu alayh. But if you come out tonight with only this tradition and you understand it, it will be more than enough. You want to hear it? Yes? Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. How about a lot of salawat? The tradition says, as you can find in Jama a hadith al Shia for Sayyid al Burjurdi, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ida dana al abdu ilallah. He says, if the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes close to Allah, Allah does what? Allah comes even closer to him. Now bear in mind, Allah azza wa jal is not physical. He's not bound to time or space. So here, we're speaking in a metaphoric manner or a figurative manner. When you take a step towards Allah, you do something He likes. Allah does what? He brings you closer. So He bestows upon you a large amount of mercy or guidance. The Prophet continues. He says, وَمَنْ تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيْهِ شِبْرًا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا He who takes a step towards Allah, when that step equates one hand span, Allah will take a step towards that slave that equates a cubit, not a hand span. Again, Rasulullah is talking metaphorically or figuratively. He says, وَمَنْ تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيْهِ بَاعًا When a person takes a step that equates a cubit towards Allah, Allah takes a step towards that slave which equates the span of outstretched arms. Then he says, وَمَنْ أَتَاهُ مَشْيًا جَاءَهُ هَرْوَلَةً And he who walks towards Allah, Allah jogs towards him. Allah is not physical, remember. What is the meaning of this tradition? Long story short, the meaning is, when Allah sees that you're trying to get closer to him, he aids you, he gives you the pushes you need to get even closer and closer. Allah is very merciful, very kind, very generous. Hence, my brothers and sisters, we should never lose hope in God. This is 
a really important issue that some youth fall into, unfortunately. When they see themselves, you know, sinning day and night, sinning excessively, or committing grave sins, they might get to a point where they say, the likes of me cannot be for forgiven. That's wrong. Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah's mercy is much greater than you imagine. And He wants you to repent. Yes, feel guilt. Regret what you did. Perform istighfar. Cry over your sin. But don't lose hope. Allah Azza wa Jal forgave Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Correct? Al-Hur was on the evil side. He was on the side of Ibn Ziyad. On the day of Ashura, hours before his killing, Al-Hur repented. Hours in his last day on earth, he repented hours before his killing. What did Allah do? Did Allah accept him or reject him? What is it? He accepted him. Sahih? Aba Abdullah salawatullah alayhi embraced Hur. Ahlan wa salam. If you repent, Allah Ta'ala will accept your repentance. And subhanAllah, he became from the Ansar. Today when we go visit Al-Hur, all of us tell him what? Bi abi anta wa ummi. May my father and mother be sacrificed for you. Al-Hur committed a crime, my brothers and sisters, much worse than the crimes we commit. Much worse than most of our crimes, most of our sins. He stood in the face of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. But when he repented, Allah accepted him. So, what makes you think Allah will not accept me or you when we repent to him? Jalla Jalalu. Allah is all merciful. Then the Quran says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَهُ وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Allah says that He bestowed a good blessing on Ibrahim السلام, possibly alluding to the wealth He gave him because Ibrahim was a wealthy man and also alluding to the morals Ibrahim had because he had sublime morals and when you have sublime morals, what happens? People, people respect you you start to possess a status in the eyes of the people because of your morals. And at the same time, you experience inner peace. When you have good morals, you experience inner peace. You might be going through difficulty. You might be imprisoned. You might be tortured on a physical level. But on an internal level, a spiritual one, you will be at peace. What's interesting, and in fact shocking, is that Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Surely Ibrahim in the hereafter is one of the righteous slaves of God. You might say, what's so shocking? What's so shocking? خير inshallah. Ibrahim is a prophet. Ibrahim is a prophet of God. He is definitely righteous. He was righteous on earth. And he will be righteous in the hereafter. What's the big deal, Ya Hammam? Let me tell you what's the big deal. It seems when you read the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be degrading Ibrahim. As in that's what you might think. When you read Allah saying, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ You might think Allah is saying, you know what, Ibrahim is not that great. He's just one of the righteous slaves of God. What I mean to say is, since he was a prophet, why didn't Allah say, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Since he was an imam, why didn't Allah say, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْأَئِمَّةِ Allah said, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ let me give you an example to clarify the problem here. To clarify the problem. Suppose you have a doctor, someone who has a PhD, and you want to describe that doctor. You come forth and say, Fulan graduated from high school. People will be amazed. 
at what you said. Because he did not only graduate from high school, he has a PhD. So you should say something else about this person. It seems that you're degrading him. Ibrahim is a prophet and an imam. Allah says, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ So you might think Allah Ta'ala is putting him down, but the reality is Allah isn't. Allah Jalla Jalaluh does not degrade his prophet Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhim. Then why does he say, إِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ You want to know why? To tell you how great righteousness is. Righteousness is a big deal in the eyes of Allah. So big that Allah tells you, here I am. Describing one of the greatest creations I created. Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam. Who was a prophet and an imam. And I tell you, he was from the righteous so know, O oh Muslims, that being righteous is a big deal. When you're righteous, you are a gem. In fact, you're more important than a gem. When you're righteous, you're a crystal. You're more important than a crystal. That's what Allah Azza wa wants to tell you. And that's the reality. If you remember yesterday, we said what? Even if we do not reach the status of Abis and Habib bin Mudahir and Jaun rahmatullah alayhim, then let us try our best to be believers who are righteous. Because if we can exit the world as believers who are righteous, then we will have a lofty status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells you in Surah Al-Bayyinah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ Who can continue the verse for me? هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Surely those who believe and perform good deeds are the best of God's creations. So when you are a mu'min or a mu'mina and you're righteous, meaning you're doing what Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to do, you are great. In fact, you're beyond great. That's what Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling you. Yes, you have to remain humble. You have to remain humble. But in the eyes of Allah, you will be great. So righteousness is a big deal. However, in our day and age, being righteous is not the easiest. Correct? Especially with all the different forms of deviation all the different forms of misguidance that surround us. And the sad reality is, as we progress in the occultation of Sahib al-Zaman, Allah Ta'ala Faraja, people gradually start to lose their faith. That's what Ahlul Bayt said, alayhum salam. The number of believers gradually starts to diminish. You realize that less and less people actually adhere to the essential, pure path of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as was And so you realize that the majority of the world is following a path that differs with yours. The majority of the world is following the path of doom. You're trying to adhere to the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as was That's not the easiest. It is not an easy task. I'm not saying it's extremely difficult, but it's not the easiest test. Hence, we need to do our best in order to pass this test. Tomorrow, inshallah, tomorrow, if Allah Azza wa Jal wills, I will mention a story to you pertaining to Imam al Hussein salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh that most likely most of you have not heard before. It speaks about an incident that took place two years before Muawiyah's death. And what Aba Abdullah did two years before Muawiyah's death. Inshallah, when we narrate the story, we'll see what we can learn from it and how that story can help us preserve our faith in our current era. However, in short, we need to be aware that 
we're surrounded with misguidance, hence we need to be prudent and we need to be careful at what we do, what we see, what we listen to, what we accept or what we reject. Amongst the challenges that we're facing today is the movement called the LGBTQ movement or call it the pride movement. It's growing, unfortunately. And it seems that more and more people are accepting it. I'm not saying that the majority of mankind accept it. On the contrary, up until now, it seems that the minority accepts it. The majority rejects it. Yes, not everyone is speaking against this movement. It's growing. And so, suppose that one day we get to a point where the majority of mankind accept it, what should be our stance? Should we just, you know, as they say, go with the flow? You know, give in? Or should we do something else? Obviously, or it should be obvious, that we cannot give in. Why? For multiple reasons. Number one, the things, the actions, the deeds that this movement calls towards contradict human nature. It contradicts what we call al fitrah How do we know it contradicts human nature? Well, we know it through our own souls. There are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala programmed you and I to know. When you're born into this world, you're already programmed to know it. It's innate. It's part of your system. And so one of those things is knowing the unlawfulness and hideousness of marrying someone from the same gender. We know it. The hideousness or awfulness or unlawfulness of homosexuality. We know it. But you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and confirms what you know. Hence, he mentions what the story of Lut in the Quran. You've all read the Quran, or most of you have read the Quran, and you've realized that the story of Lut is quite repetitive. Correct? Is it? It is repetitive, right? It's one of those stories Allah Ta'ala mentions multiple times in the Quran. Tell me, what is the main crime that the Quran sheds light on regarding the people of Lut and why they were completely wiped out by God subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did they do? They were homosexuals. The Quran says it. Yet, there are people who have the audacity to say, you know what? There is no contradiction between Islam and the LGBTQ movement. Excuse me? Who are you trying to fool? Al Quran al Kareem is saying otherwise. Al Quran al Kareem is telling you Allah Ta'ala wiped out a whole civilization because they were homosexual. The only people who were saved were Lut and his daughters because they did not give in. They were mustaqimin, they were following the straight path. Who are you trying to fool? This is really important, my brothers and sisters, because there is an attempt today, and there was an attempt a few weeks ago before Muharram, to give that message in one of the Canadian, Canadian universities. There was a picture giving that message that you can be Muslim and you can be homosexual. Wrong. Homosexuality in the eyes of Islam and the eyes of Judaism and Christianity is a sin. No one can fool us. Even Judaism says it. Even Christianity says it. When you read the Old Testament, the story of Lord Salamullahi Alayhi is mentioned there. And so it should be clear to all Muslimin and all Muslimat that this issue cannot be accepted. It cannot be accepted. One might say, well, what if, what if, you know, I have 
a particular desire towards the same gender, or I feel some sort of inclination towards the same gender, what should I do? What you should do is what? Work on yourself. What you should do is try to self-purify and get rid of that inclination. You can do it. You're a human being. The human being has outstanding powers. Allah says in Surah Al-Shams, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Successful is the one who purifies his soul. There's this concept that's being, you know, shoved into our brains today. If you have a particular desire to do something, you should do it. Wrong. If that is the case, then what makes me different than an animal? What makes me different than a pig, for example? What? This is wrong. Islam said no. Islam said if you have the desire to do something, you should look. Does Allah allow you to do it or not? Does it contradict human nature or not? If it contradicts human nature, if Allah Ta'ala does not allow you to do it, you can't do it. You have to tame yourself. You have to work on yourself. Or else, if we want to, you know, say or believe that as soon as you have the urge to do a particular deed, you can do it because you have that urge, then tell me, what happens if, you know, God forbid, God forbid one day someone has desire or inclination towards marrying one of his direct family members, such as his mother or his daughter or his sister. I'm really serious about this. You know, one day you might find some sort of maniac who tells you, who says marrying your mother or your sister or your daughter is wrong? You might hear this one day. Don't be surprised if you hear it. al Quran al Karim does what? I hope you're all focusing with me because this is a really serious topic. al Quran al Karim confirms human nature. It confirms what you know because religion does not contradict fatra. Religion flows hand, goes hand in hand with fatra. It flows perfectly with it. And Allah Azawajal comes and confirms the laws of fatra in case one day someone purposely forgets or neglects the laws of fatra. Tell me. Which of you, which of us, does not know that marrying our own mother is unlawful? Do you really need Allah to tell you in the Quran marrying your mom is unlawful for you to know it? You don't need it. You don't. You know it through your fatra, right? But even then Allah mentions it explicitly. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ It is unlawful upon you to marry your mothers and daughters and sisters. And the list goes on. Why? Why does he say this? Because Allah knows maybe one day there will be some sort of maniac who says, who said it's unlawful? Allah tells him, I did. I said it. So, we need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that ultimately we are human beings. We can control ourselves. If you feel a particular inclination or desire towards, you know, the same gender, you can do something about it. We're being taught today that, no, 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 this is normal. And you shouldn't change. They're trying to fool us. They're trying to fool us. They're trying to lure us into into doom. Thus, it is really important to keep the story of Lut salamullahi alayhi and the narrations of Ahlul Bayt concerning this topic in mind. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't repeat the story of Lut, you know, 10 or 20 times in the Quran for no reason. Remember, Allah Ta'ala knows everything that is going to happen. He knows everything, Jalla Jalalu. He did not repeat that story for no reason. And so, if we get to a point where the majority of the world, you know, gives in, 
to homosexuality or any other type of deviation, what should we do? Well, let's go back to Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Salamullah. One lesson. If there's a lesson we learn from Karbala, and indeed there are thousands of lesson, lessons we learn from Karbala, if there's one lesson we learn from Karbala, Al Hussein, Salawatullah Alayh, it is not to give in to deviation, misguidance, hypocrisy, and tyranny. Here is Aba Abdullah al Hussein, who was pressured by his enemies. Yazid and his Shias used multiple tactics to pressure Imam al Hussein to make him submit. In Medina, they tried to kill him. Hence, he had to leave Medina. He went to Mecca. In Mecca, Yazid sent him multiple men and told them, You find Al Hussein and you kill him even if he is holding on to the Kaaba. Hence, he had to leave Mecca. They sent him Al Hur with his army. Hence, he had to change his route as he was going to Kufa. He had to change his route and then ended up in Karbala. When he settles in Karbala, what happens? What happens? Salawatullah alayki Aba Abdullah. Thousands of troops begin coming to Karbala, not to support him, rather to kill him. Then they deprive him of water. And he has children with him. He has women who have absolutely no sin. And he does not have a sin, of course. But the children are beyond innocent. He sees his children thirsty, his women thirsty. They were trying to pressure him. You're going to give in, Ya Hussein. He stands on the day of Ashura. Remember this. You'll need it one day. And he faces an army consisting of 30,000 soldiers, at least 30,000 soldiers. At least. Some Sunni scholars say there were more than 30,000 uh, soldiers in Karbala. He sees their spears, their shields, their arrows, their swords. Being there and just watching that humongous army in front of you is enough to make you quiver in your boots. But Hussein is the son of Ali. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. He's not scared by their number. He stands in front of them and he says this golden word. Wallah, la u'atikum biyadi i'ta' al-dhalil wa la afirru firar al-abid. I swear by Allah, I will not pledge allegiance to you like a humiliated man, nor will I flee like a slave. This is Al Hussein who teaches you what? Resistance. You have the right to say this is wrong. This is indecent. We don't accept it. That's what he teaches us, Salawatullah Alayh. Although he was outnumbered, he said, Wa inni, wa inni zahifun bihadihi al usra ala qillatil adad wa kathratil adu. He said, surely I shall walk forth and fight with this family of mine. As our number is little, I only have a few supporters. And I have many enemies. And my supporters have abandoned me. Meaning the so-called Muslims who were supposed to support him have abandoned him. Salawatullah wa salamu alayh. The Imam says, even then, although we are a minority, I will stand and fight against the Yazidi army. Of course, he fought after they fought him. It was a defensive fight. So he taught us resistance, alayhi salatu wassalam. Tomorrow, if we're still alive, inshallah, we're going to narrate the story of the Imam, which teaches us how we can preserve our faith during the occultation. Although we're facing different types of challenges. So stay tuned, inshallah. Aba Abdullah, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh, knew that ultimately he was going to get killed in Karbala. On his way to Karbala, he stops at different lands. And in each land, different events take place. 
He stops at a land called Shukuk. In Shukuk, a man from Iraq, from Kufa, comes to the Imam. The Imam asks him, what's happening in Kufa? What's happening in Iraq? Of course, he knows. But there's a reason why he's asking. He tells him, the people of Iraq are all against you. They're all what? Against him. How sad. They're the ones who told him, come. We're ready to support you. He tells him, everyone's against you, Abu Abdullah. The Imam, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, he says, إِنَّ الْأَمْرَ لِلَّهِ يَفْعَلُ مَا يَشَاءُ Surely, the divine decree lies in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرَبُّنَا تَبَارَكَ هُوَ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ فِي شَأْنٍ Allah Azza wa Jal every day manages the affairs of His creations and manifests a new decree. He manifests a new part of the divine decree. He moves on. At a certain spot, the Imam settles in a desert. This narration can be found in Al Bidayah wa Nihayah for Ibn Kathir, who was a Nasibi, but he still narrated the events of Karbala. Ibn Kathir says, when he settled in a desert, a man came and he saw tents. He asked, to whom do these tents belong? He was told, Al Hussein. Hussein is inside. Salawatullah wa salamu alayka, Abu Abdullah. Could you imagine if you saw a tent and someone told me, someone told you inside the tent? Sahib al zaman salawatullah alayhi is inside that tent. How would you feel? He was told, Aba Abdullah is inside. So he entered upon Imam al Hussein. He says, I saw an old man reading Quran as his tears were flowing on his cheeks. Who was it? Al Hussein. But he wasn't old. He was only 57. He was not an old man. However, his hair had turned white. Salamullah alayhi. His hair had turned gray or white. Nonetheless, he was reading Quran. The man told him, Yabna Rasulullah, may my father and mother be sacrificed for you. What brought you here? Why have you settled in this desert when no one resides here? He told him, Hadihi kutubu ahlil kufati ilayya wa la arahum illa qatiliya. He tells them, Ahlul Kufa, they sent me letters. Here are their letters. And I believe that they will definitely kill me. He knew his fate. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. He knew that they will kill him. He told him, if they kill me, they will not leave any sanctity without violation. They will violate all sanctities. And at that point, Allah Ta'ala will set an opponent upon them that will humiliate them. They will become extremely humiliated. You might ask, then why did he go to Ahl al-Kufa, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi? If he knows how treacherous they are, why did he go? This is a deep question that requires multiple lectures. But I'll give you a concise answer for now. Aba Abdullah said, wherever he goes, he will be killed. He knew that as long as he does not pledge allegiance to Yazid, they're going to find him and kill him. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And so he kept on moving. He meets Al-Hur in Sharaf. Al-Hur, as you heard, causes the Imam to change his route. The Imam keeps on moving and moving and moving. Until he reaches a land where the horse of the Imam stops. He tries to move it. The horse does not move. So he changes horses. The second horse does not move. He changes horses. The third horse does not move. He keeps on changing horses until he rides seven different horses. They don't move. Abu Abdullah knows 
but he wants to show us that this is the promised land. This is where the ultimate fight between truth and falsehood will happen. And so he asks his companions, he tells them, does this land have a name? They say, it is called Ard al -Ghabiriya. He says, does it have another name? He's told it's called Naynawa. Again, the Imam asks, does it have another name? He's waiting for that specific name, which breaks the hearts. Is there another name? He's told it's called Taf. Is there another name? He's told it's called Karbala, meaning the land of trials and distress. When Aba Abdullah, salawatullah alayhi, hears that name, his eyes tear. Then Aba Abdullah lifts his arms towards the sky and he says, Allahumma. أعوذ بك من الكرب والبلاء Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from trial and distress Then he addresses his family members and companions saying اقفوا ولا ترحلوا Stop here and do not leave this land فغاغنا والله مناخ ركابنا I swear by Allah this is the land in which we will settle I swear by Allah this is the land in which our blood will be shed I swear by Allah this is the land in which our sanctity will be violated I swear by Allah this is the land in which our men will be killed I swear by Allah this is the land in which our children will be slaughtered I swear by Allah this is the land in which our graves will be visited by people this is the land that my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala promised me telling me that I will be buried in this land and whatever Rasulullah whatever Rasulullah promised will take place the tradition says then Aba Abdullah gathered Banu Hashim, the women, the youth, and the children. He gazed at them all. Then he began crying. I say, Aba Abdullah, salawatullah alayk. What happened at that point specifically for you to cry? Were you foretelling? Were you foreseeing the events of Ashura? Were you seeing your son Ali Al Akbar coming back to the camp telling you, Father, I need to drink, Father, I am thirsty? Were you seeing Al Qasim Salamullah Ali charging at the enemy as he defends you? Were you seeing Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas trying his best to bring the water back to the camp as he is surrounded by hundreds of enemies? I am sorry for this word, Abu Abdullah. Did you see the hands of Zainab Shakold? As the enemy brings Zainab out of Karbala. And as the enemy whips the back of Zainab, Salamullah alayha. Aywa Zainaba wa Husayna wa ahla bayt Muhammad. Ajarakumullah. All of these events took place. Aba Abdullah and his family were killed. The rest of the family were taken into captivity. And the days passed. 
until our Imam Zainul Abideen came back to Medina with his aunts and sisters. When he comes back to Medina, the Imam stands on the boundaries of Medina. And he turns to a man called Bishr ibn Hadlam. He says, oh Bishr, may Allah bless your father. Bishr, he was, your father was a poet. Are you able to recite poetry? Bishr tells him, yes, my master, I myself am a poet. And so Imam al-Sajjad tells him, then in that case, go into Medina and mourn Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Allah. Bishr says, at that point I embarked my horse and I went into Medina. It is said he carried a black flag and he began calling out, Ya ala yathrib, la muqama lakum biha. Oh, people of Yathrib, you should not reside in Yathrib anymore. It seems he had important news to tell them. And so they told him, what has happened, Ya Bishr? He said, I have news to tell you, but I will not say it here. I will say it beside the grave of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi the man gathered, the people gathered to hear Bashar. Bashar ascended a high piece of land. Then he cried and composed these lines of poetry. Ya ahla yaath, ribala Oh, people of Yathrib, you should not reside in it anymore. Qutil al-Husay, nufad mu'i midraru. Hussein has been killed, and so I shed my tears for him. Tell us, O oh Bishr, what was his state when he was killed? Al Jismum Enu Bekar Bala Amudarajan, Wa Rasum En. على القناة يدار as for his body it was covered in blood in Karbala and as for his head it was transported from land to land on a spear when Bishr recited these couplets of poetry the people of Medina began wailing for Abba Abdullah. Bishr could not believe his eyes. He says, every lady, every muhajjaba, even the ladies who would not usually come out of their homes, came out as they were wailing and scratching their faces for Abba Abdullah. He says, I never saw so many men and women crying on a specific day. It resembled the day Rasulullah passed away. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Where does the tragedy intensify? When does it intensify? When Umm al Banin, Salamullah alayha, comes to Bishr bin Hadlam. Bishr is mourning Aba Abdullah. People are wailing for the Imam. All of a sudden, an honorable lady who has a child on her shoulder that was the son of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salawatullah wa salamu alayh. She comes to him, telling him, inform me about my son Hussein. Allahu Akbar. I am mourning Aba Abdullah. She tells me, inform me about my son Hussein. Who is this lady? He is told, this is Umm al -Baneen, the wife of Amir al Mu'mineen. Salamullah. And so Bashar 
wanted to console Ummul Banin. He knows she has four sons who were killed in Karbala. And so he tells her, may Allah greatly reward you. With the loss, may Allah greatly reward you for the loss of your son Ja'far. Allahu Akbar. As if I see Ummul Banin surprised, not because he told her about Ja'far, but because he mentioned Ja'far before mentioning Aba Abdullah. And so she tells him, inform me about my son Hussein. He tells her, may Allah greatly reward you for the loss of your son Abdullah. She tells him, inform me about my son Hussein. He tells her, may Allah greatly reward you for the loss of your son Uthman. She tells him, my son, inform me about my son Hussein. He tells her, ya umm al -Baneen. May Allah greatly reward you for the loss of Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas. Salawatullahi alayh. When Umm al banin hears the name of Abbas, Abbas's son falls off her shoulder. She places her hand on her heart and she says, O oh son of Hadlam, you have ripped my heart apart. You have informed me about the killing of my four sons. But I want you to know, O oh son of Hadlam, that all of my sons and everyone on the face of the earth should be sacrificed for Aba Abdullah. O oh son of Hadlam, inform me about my son Hussein. Ajarakum Allah, Bisharat the point said, Ya Umm al Banin, Azam Allah lak al Ajr, Bi Abi Abdullah al Hussein. O Umm al Banin, may Allah greatly reward you for the loss of Abi Abdullah, for we have left him. Decapitated in Karbala. When Umm al Banin heard this, she called out, Wa walada! Wa Husayna! My son, O oh Husayn! Then Umm al banin fell unconscious. Allahu Akbar, ya Umm al banin What kind of faith do you have, ya Umm al banin How great is your faith and your certainty? You ask about Imam al Hussein before asking about your own children. Naam Umm al banin Umm al banin wanted Aba Abdullah to come back safe and sound to Medina. Hence the poet says, as if she addresses, as if she says, Wallah gilit ninna'i, gilit ninna'i min gilli. Ah, gilit ninna'i min gilli gidha wa kilhum. ضحايا ضحايا وابنك وجعفر ابنك جان اول غم والله قلت له من قال لي قضى وكلهم ضحايا وجعفر ابنك جان اول غم as if she says I told Bishr when he told me all of your sons ya Umm al banin were killed in Karbala and the first one was Ja'far Ah, get fidwal al-sabit fidwal al-sabit get la al-walad khalum yiruhun wabu al-sajjad wabu al-sajjad madmooni I told him, I do not mind sacrificing my children for Aba Abdullah, but I want Aba Abdullah to come back. 
آه بس قصدي يظل حزين والديوان والديوان بيه يعمر ويرفع وحشة الخوان However, I want him to come back because his presence will comfort me after losing my sons. جسمه وهالخبر منا انخطف لوني He told me أبا عبد الله is gone يا أم البنين يا أم البنين أبا عبد الله left this world His body was left on the plains of كربلاء When he told me this my face changed آه يا أم البنين Yes, أم البنين was devastated over the loss of Aba Abdullah and the loss of her sons. Hence, it is narrated that she would go to Baqiyah and she would make five graves in Baqiyah. One represents the grave of Hussein and four represent the graves of her sons she would mourn them one day she mourns her son Abbas saying Ya man ra'al Abbas karra ala jama'ir al-naqad Oh you who saw Abba al-Fadl attacking his enemies attacking the cowards who were fighting Hussein in Karbala يا من رأى العباس كر على جماهير النقد ووراه من بني حيدر ووراه من أبناء حيدر كل ليث ذي لبد Oh you who saw Abbas fighting as the warriors from the descendants of Ali from the, son, from the sons of Ali were fighting behind him أنبئت أن ابني أصيب برأسي مقطوع يد I was told that my son my son's head was struck as his hand had been severed ويلي على شبني أمالا she says, My heart breaks for you, Abal Fadl, when your head was struck by that iron bar. Then she says this heartbreaking word. She says, If only his sword was in in his right or left hand. If that was the case, no one would have approached him. Naam ya Umm al They wouldn't have been able to kill Abbas if he still had one of his hands. Salawatullah alayhi. This was the stance of Umm al in this world. I will conclude with this tragedy. Umm al asks about Aba Abdullah before asking about her sons when Bishr ibn Hadlam mourns Aba Abdullah al Hussein. On the day of judgment, Fatima al Zahra, Salamullah alayha, compensates Umm al How? She brings the hands of Abu al Fadl al Abbas. 
and she asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge between her and those who severed the hands of Abel Fadl. It is said she calls out, Ya Adlu Ya Hakim. Oh, he who is wise, oh, he who is just, oh, come, bayni wa bayna man qata'a hadayn al kaffayn. Judge between me and he who severed these two hands. What sin did these hands commit for them to be severed from the rest? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون توجهوا إلى الله تعالى اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بأحب الخلق إليك محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين فرج عنا يا الله وأسك الله عز وجل to hasten the appearance of صاحب الزمان to make us from his sincere followers and supporters to forgive our sins and to fulfill our needs. If anyone has a need, ask it at the moment and Allah Ta'ala will answer you. Allahumma bihaqqi mawlatina, umm al-baneen, salamullahi alayha, iqdi hajata kulli muhtaj, la siyama hawaij, man sa'alani al-du'a, wa hawaij al-hadirin wa al-mushahideen, ya rabbal alameen. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, to heal all sick believers for the sake of the sick Imam Zain al Abidin, Salawatullahi Alaihi. And we ask him to bless the souls of all believers who have passed away, especially our dear family members and companions, those who are completely forgotten and never mentioned, the great martyrs and the noble scholars, Ila Arwahim Jami'an, Wa Ila Arwahi Amwatikum, Wa Arwah Walidaya Wa Akhi, Wa Habibi Hussein, Nabatu Thawab Majisina Hada. وثواب الفاتحة تسبقها صلاة على محمد وآل محمد